Well, it's so nice to have you uh, all come together here for this online forum relating the tuning board with somatic experiencing. And if you happen to be a, not a somatic experiencing practitioner, I think you still might find it has some relevance to uh, what we're going to do today. Um, I'd like us for a moment to take a breath, just to kind of come together as a group. There's a lot of us. So we're just kind of come centered for a moment, put away all uh, distractions that may take your attention away. Um, we're probably going to move pretty quickly because these, uh, this is a big topic. And um, I want to at least uh, describe it well enough so that you feel uh, like you feel like you, you got what you came for and you might even be a little inspired. Uh, before I hand it over to Emily for some technical information, I just wanna uh, say a little bit about uh, what we're gonna do. My perspective or my orientation towards um, my practice has always been on the basis and the context of movement. So that's what's gonna be uh, the emphasis today. I'm going to first describe somatic experiencing as it's been um, uh, defined by the originator, Peter Levine. And then I'm going to define trauma as it's being uh, defined also by Peter Levine from the SE perspective. And then I'm gonna talk about the tuning board and what it does and how it relates to the two topics of somatic experiencing and trauma. And finally, just uh, mention something about um, why verticality is important. So with that in mind, I'm gonna hand it back over to Emily and she's gonna just talk us through what um, we need to know from a technical point of view. Great, thank you, Daryl. Um, so uh, to start with, um, if you are uh, I, some of us may have been spending a lot of time on Zoom and other of us, others of us may still be rather new. So to start with, I um, just wanted to let you know about the different view options. Um, so you can use in the top right corner of your screen, you can use gallery view where you'll see many faces. Um, but what we ac actually recommend for this session is to do speaker view. Um, and, and you can actually even pin Daryl. So then you'll see his, his uh, screen and his face and eventually the demo on, in a larger screen. So you can play with those two options and, um, and see what, what works best for you. Um, we also have the chat function. So um, we, um, we, we have quite a number of participants today, which is wonderful. Um, and uh, what it means is we'd, we'd prefer to communicate by chat just to um, help keep things streamlined. So if you have questions that come up during Daryl's presentation or, um, or during the demo, either you can put them in the chat and we'll kind of hang on to those and answer as many as we can in time, um, or you can save them for the end. We will have a bit of time at the end uh, for Q&A. So, um, and if you'd like now to just practice using the chat, you can just say a quick um, hello and where you're from. We know we have people from, from all over the world today. Um, uh, I am, we are asking everybody to stay muted during the presentation and demo, again, to limit background noise. So if you go to the bottom left hand of your screen, you'll see where you can mute yourself. Um, and if, if we do have background noise from somebody, I, I ask you forgiveness in advance that I may mute you as the host uh, just to, to help minimize that, that distraction. We, we are recording the session today. That's because we have had actually wonderful demand. So, so some people who weren't able to, to we, we sold out for the session, but we do wanna pro provide the recording. Um, so if you'd rather not have your face, um, I mean, we, the recording will primarily be Daryl and his presentation. Um, but if you want to, to be 100% sure that you're not in that recording, you can turn off your video um, and, and that's just fine. Um, I think that's everything for now. I will just paste a, a brief agenda in the chat um, and uh, it includes introduction and a presentation by Daryl, a demo, and then Q&A at the end. So with that, I will hand it back off to Daryl. 
Okay. So, uh, let's start. I did forget to mention there will be a short demo. Uh, it will be enough to hopefully illustrate what I've been talking about in terms of these uh, concepts. So you get a sense of what it actually looks like. It's not gonna be like a full on um, session that, that I might do, but I think you'll still get the idea hopefully, okay? So, okay. So the first idea is I wanna talk about uh, defining what is somatic experiencing? And this is uh, from an article that Peter Levine co-authored with a couple of other individuals. And you can find this at the Somatic Experiencing website. But um, somatic experiencing, according to this article and the definition, emphasizes guiding the client's attention to interoceptive, kinesthetic, and proprioceptive experience with the use of kinesthetic and interoceptive imagery. So there's a, there's a lot in that, there's a lot in that uh, sentence right there that um, really lays the groundwork for what I'd like to uh, have us get a feel for. The first thing I'd like you to, uh, to see is that guiding the client's attention. So we're talking about presence and awareness and um, opening up and, and uh, supporting the client's sense of presence. And when we talk about interoceptive, kinesthetic, and proprioceptive experience, right away, this is um, what I was referring to in terms of a movement uh, experience. So all of these interoception, kinesthetics, and proprioceptive are alive and vibrant, and they involve um, our ability to sense in the body, the activity that's uh, being um, stimulated and uh, move through our nervous systems. And then by guiding and bringing a sense of uh, presence and awareness, we are linking up this, um, this vitality with this aliveness in the body. Now, these, this vibrancy is not unique to somatic experiencing. Pretty much every um, therapeutic modality that has to do with wholeness uh, has to do with uh, movement and vitality because that's what life is and that's what we're doing when we're uh, when we're doing therapeutic modalities but this is the um, uh, part of the definition that Peter Levine has arrived at to describe somatic experiencing again what is somatic experiencing it's the effectiveness according to Peter Levine using attention to the interoceptive, proprioceptive, and kinesthetic sensation. Sensation being awareness of stimulation of the sense organ. And the importance of taking into account the instinctive bodily-based protective reactions when dealing with stress and trauma. So again, I wanna just uh, show again all the movement that's implied in these uh, statements and, and definitions of what somatic experiencing is bodily-based protective reactions. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, um, your, your studies and your practice in somatic experiencing, reactions being defensive responses in, in many forms. And kinesthetic sensation is a very, like I said, a very alive process. Uh, I like to think of it in terms of um, a flow of sensation and that should make a little more sense as we go along. So just take a moment again to feel into the, the, um, the, the vibrancy and the movement inherent in the description of this healing modality called somatic experiencing. The therapist guides the client in attending to visceral sensation or subtle motor impulses associated with incomplete defensive responses. And that kind of brings together the first two streams that I showed about the definition of somatic experiencing. Again, this comes from that article by Peter Levine and uh, his co-authors, 
that you can find on the website. I just want you to take a moment and just feel this. So the therapist is guiding the client's attention to visceral sensation, subtle motor responses. Again, all the movement inherent in that description associated with, well, defensive responses, but in this case, they're incomplete. That doesn't mean they aren't still there or they aren't being stimulated. So that in essence is um, definition of somatic experiencing, uh, not complete as you know, because it's a very deep subject, very expansive subject, but this is pretty much what Peter um, uh, describes as the, what defines somatic experiencing. complex dynamical system formed by subcortical autonomic limbic motor and arousal systems. Again, as you hear me speaking, you can get a sense of, of aliveness in all this. Instinctive bodily-based protective reactions when dealing with stress and trauma, using attention to interoceptive, proprioceptive, and kinesthetic sensation as a therapeutic tool. Sensation is something that stimulated, travels through the nervous system, is evaluated and interpreted through, through the nervous system and through the brain structures and responses are generated. Okay, so now we go to trauma. And this is again, according to uh, the definition of Peter Levine relative to the somatic experiencing. They arise when residual energy from the experience is not discharged from the body. So this energy remains trapped in the nervous system. So now we have a, a, a very uh, clear contrast against the movement of all that vitality and trauma as energy that is trapped and not moving through the nervous system. So we have sensation, proprioception, stimulation, kinesthetic awareness, all moving through the nervous system. And then we have trauma where that energy is not moving through the nervous system. So we you get a feel for the contrast in those two from a movement perspective. Trauma from an SE uh, perspective, an internal straitjacket created when a devastating moment is frozen in time, we are frozen in fear. An internal straitjacket. You can't get uh, much restrict, more restriction of mo movement and motion than being in a straitjacket. So just again, getting a feel for the difference now between the, the flow of sensation and the stimulation of vitality being straitjacketed and frozen. And where does that go? What happens? They go into certain places in the body, certain locations where they become out of touch, out of reach. We tend to actually lose track of them or didn't even know they exist until we, until we rediscover them. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is that process of encountering this frozen energy. What is trauma? One's human immobility responses do not resolve. They cannot make the transition back to normal life. It becomes chronically coupled with fear and intense negative emotions such as dread, revulsion, and helplessness. So in this immobilized energy, there's a lot of information and that information has to do with emotions, thoughts, memories, any other uh, type of associated uh, uh, experience that happens to be straitjacketed and frozen somewhere in the body. So there's the contrast between what somatic experiencing is defined as and uh, at core what it is doing and trauma, which is at the other end of the spectrum and is the antithesis to that, to that flow of life through the body. So now what is the tuning board? 
how does it relate to these definitions of somatic experiencing and trauma? One basic way to, to describe it is it's a somatic tool that addresses this problem of non-resilient ability to return to a fluid vertical nervous system. It's a tool, the tuning board is a tool. It's a somatic tool because it brings our awareness in to the body and into its relationship to this flow of motion, flow of life, relative to the immobilized straitjacket frozen energy that's becoming available or inaccessible or untouchable to us. What does the tuning board do? In essence, the tuning board provides movement. This is a very special kind of movement that I have found is unique to tuning board. Tuning board is in the category of a balance board, but it is a very unique feeling to it. And I've never come across a, uh, another balance board that um, has this, these kind of qualities that I'm gonna list here. So with the tuning board, the movement is persistent. It never quits. You can't make it stop. And in fact, you really don't want to make it stop because it's a gentle movement. It's a, I call it a loving movement because it is persistent and gentle. It talks to us at a very deep level. It goes very deep in the nervous system very quickly in a gentle kind of uh, caressing way. Uh, that's what the tuning board provides. As opposed to some other balance boards, it may um, have kind of a, a jolt if you lose the balance and throws a shock through the nervous system, or it gets to uh, other ones that get too mushy and it feels like the bottom's dropping out under our feet, which is not good from an autonomic nervous system perspective. Uh, another quality of the tuning board is it moves in every plane, including vertical. So it doesn't move just left or right, front or back. It can float depending on uh, the way our weight is uh, falling and how we're being uh, adjusting ourselves in gravity. So we have this nice uh, feedback in every direction on the tuning board that keeps, uh, doesn't limit us to only one or two directions. There's also a vertical component where we can feel the give underneath our feet but it doesn't collapse because there's a, there's a firm enough surface, which this combination of a, a firm enough surface with a certain vertical give to it um, provides a really nice uh, feedback to the autonomic nervous system. So with that firm surface, we get a, a feedback response that might be a little bit more towards the mobilization side of things. And with the give and that soft, uh, kind of cushion we get uh, an association more with a parasympathetic type of um, response where it's calming and, and soothing. So again, this is why the tuning board has a very special quality to it. It generates kinesthetic sensing. It immediately takes us into movement in the body or where we sense we're not moving or just a sense of the body, what's happening with us internally relative to what's happening around us. I call this uh, what it generates kinesthetically, kinesthetic images. And these are what are referred to as sensory-based feeling states. Uh, they can get a kind of energetic shape to them and they may even be associated with um, an actual image. So if you, uh, one way to um, describe this would be, uh, if we're looking at a work of art hanging on a wall, the work of art is not doing anything. It's not moving, it's just there. But what happens in our body? What does it stimulate in our, our sensing? And what, what kind of feeling state or what kind of um, energetic motions or shapes occur as a result of, for example, looking at a, a beautiful work of art. And uh, this informs interoception, which I'll mention a little bit more about later. Interoception is also a very active, alive feedback uh, experience. Okay, 
The tuning board movement is a continuous flow of gentle motion throughout the body, throughout the proprioceptive and reflex system. It immediately touches into the, all the reflex systems of the body, such as the postural, breathing, visceral reflexes, vestibular and ocular reflexes. These are instantly um, connecting us with non-conscious movement feedback systems that keep us vertical in space, keep us interacting with the world and each other, and um, you know, keep us uh, uh, with a sense of presence of what's happening inside and out. It's a highly resourceful form of movement that has an inherent titration healing quality to it. And uh, we'll talk about that again in a little bit too. We're all familiar with that term titration, I'm sure, as SE practitioners. The tuning board movement is a gentle amplification and a gentle acceleration of natural healing and resourcing motion through the body. The effect of the tuning board is in its most uh, centered and neutral place, it's as, it's as a wave or a wave motion flowing through the body and essentially caressing our nervous system at a very deep level. It's a gentle amplification and gentle acceleration. And uh, if you've ever been on a tuning board, you, you know what that's like. And we'll see a little bit what that's like in the demonstration. Tuning board's movement, it will find the immobilized dissociated locations and information that is kept apart from the body-mind presence. It will find those places we've lost touch with or we didn't even know existed because that's what movement does and that's what a healing process does and somatic experiencing is, as we said before, one of those healing processes and it's a very uh, beautiful and profound one. So what we're doing is we're using the tuning board to stimulate this this uh, movement that will find the places that have been in a state of uh, straitjacket immobilization and um, it will do that naturally. In a, in a sense it uh, primes the pump for you, it does the work for you and then the skill in your, as, a, as a practitioner has to do with your attunement and resonance with what's happening in your own body with that movement and relative to what's happening with the person that you're, that you're supporting on the tuning board. Okay, so tuning board movement goes everywhere in the body, ever deeper and more refined. It's reminiscent of early bonding movements that our nervous system craved, such as when we're being, well, when we're in the womb and the mother is moving and the, the fetus is developing and organs are developing, hopefully in a safe environment where everything is allowed to just move along in a sense of um, care and support. Also, when in infancy, when we're being held by the mother, hopefully, ideally, and we're being rocked or swayed or played with, and we see the expressions on the mother's face and look on the eyes and the sound of the voice, all those have to do with the nervous system that we crave as a part of feeling safe and connected. And the tuning board movement is very uh, compatible with that. It's compatible with the vagus system and visceral sensing. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It encourages titrated pendulation against traumatic immobility. Um, so this movement that continues, it continues and we won't stop. It's always present. It will find those areas that are in state of um, uh, frozen, uh, immobilized state. And it won't it won't leave because that's the nature of the movement on the tuning board, it just persists. And as it persists, eventually, those areas that are um, immobilized, they must contend with this movement. They must contend with a gentle healing movement that is not going away. 
I don't know about you, but just when, when I even say that, it's very reassuring. It's the kind of thing that um, uh, is, I think is very um, intrinsic to a beautiful uh, healing process. To know that there's something gentle and persistent that is going to be there and create that transformation. And what I mean by pendulation, I'm sure you remember Peter's descriptions as um, we go from a state of uh, intense constriction uh, intense mobilization in the state in a trauma fixated uh, location or experience and then there's the expansion side of things and that process in, uh, in, in somatic experiencing is moving back and forth that's the pendulation from constriction to expansion all the while moving the whole system in a direction of more opening and more flow so because the tuning board has this gentle continuous presence about it it encourages this titrated pendulation and of course part of the value of that is how we as uh, the practitioner interact from an SE point of view while some of them tuning board when this pendulation process continues it liberates information in the form of memories emotions thoughts realizations um, it tends to help make associations, which is a, a general uh, um, characteristic of just being human. When we're free to be unrestricted by limitations of trauma or threat, we tend to make associations rather than what tends to happen in trauma is dissociation. And then uh, somatic experiencing those associations are in the the form of um, connecting images with, with emotions, with behaviors, with meaning, and above all, the, the primary uh, entry point from a somatic experiencing point of view is through sensations in the body. So it liberates dissociated and express, uh, dis suppressed expression is another function of the tuning board movement. Now talk about a little bit about verticality. Verticality is a natural orientation of our human nervous systems. And just get a feel for this uh, picture here and imagine that this woman, imagine her nervous system aligned vertically. You see it's very natural and appropriate. We're not four-legged creatures. Our spines are not aligned horizontally like animals. We are aligned with a base two feet and our head up over our base of support. You see from this picture that we don't spend much time at all not trying to get to vertical. So even from the, from the first picture of the child on the left on your belly, you know, as you probably have seen children, when they're on their backs, they're they don't spend much time before they're trying to spin around and get on their belly like that, that young baby at the top left. And what's happening right away when on the belly, the head is starting to come up to lift off and uh, move toward a vertical. And of course, the next step is to come to sitting. And now our spine is aligned from base cranium, the spinal cord. Now it's aligned vertically, so we go very quickly and from a relative point of view, from being on our bellies to sitting and finally adding the nervous system in the lower extremities to that vertical alignment of the spinal cord. We just get a feel for that. We've all been through this pretty much. We've all done this little journey and we didn't, like I said, didn't spend much time getting there. Okay, Dr. Ida Rolf, for her structural integration was synonymous with the vertical integration of the whole body within the field of gravity. So when, we're, when we align ourselves vertically, align our, our, our nervous system and spinal cords and our whole uh, vertical posture in gravity, by necessity, we, we make fine adjustments all the time because being alive and being in gravity is a, a living movement experience. It's not fixed. There's no fixation about it. 
we may, we may think we are, we may feel we are, and this may have certain reasons why we think or feel we are, but the fact is we are, we are always being challenged and required to make these adjustments, which is, uh, if you can imagine, all the movement involved in that process. Okay, so here's a definition of vertical integration from Daniel Siegel. It's how we connect with our bodies, allowing the internal flow of sensations to rise from below into our cortically mediated awareness above. An internal flow of sensations that is happening through our vertical bodies and that process mediated above and below has to do with integration. Integration is another of those terms which is very alive and uh, very present with vitality. Verticality is one of the primary res resources we tend to lose track of under traumatic stress. Our ability to support our vertical orientation. So what happens typically in trauma, when we go into these straight jacket and immobilized states is we tend to, um, well, we, one characteristic, as we said, is a frozen straight jacket immobilized state, but it tends to be in a kind of a, well, sympathetically, if we look, we go into a crouch, getting ready to fight or run, and that state can be uh, immobilized. From a parasympathetic point of view, we tend to go into a withdrawal and a coming down, a collapse toward fetal. And we're moving away from, farther away from verticality. And again, that can become immobilized. So in trauma, we tend to lose that connection with our vertical orientation. Here's a, uh, this is kind of the gross, the larger parts of our human nervous system. And you can see it's not down to the most refined level, but you can maybe extrapolate in your own mind about that. But you look and you see, here's the alignment of our human nervous system. If you imagine, say on the, this person, this is on a tuning board and the feet and ankles are starting to move. They're not fixed like this picture is showing. So when they're moving, these nerves that you're seeing depicted here, they're being stimulated. So they're in motion. The neuromuscular connections are, are in motion. They're not frozen and locked. And those signals are traveling, sensory signals traveling up, motor signals traveling back down. The reflex arc could be short, but it also could extend longer and go all the way up through the spinal cord and up to the brain where other interpretations are offered and more motor responses are offered. Also information coming from the, from the arm, arm extremities are feeding into this. So imagine this nervous system is, is really in a wave of motion flowing. Reflexes are stimulating the, the uh, brain stem where the vestibular, uh, uh, the vestibular nucleus is relative to balance. The ocular, the ocular nerve, ocular reflexes relative to uh, the movement of um, adjusting to, to a moving balance in vertical position, all in motion all stimulating sensory motor feedback responses. Okay. So this is essentially uh, an abbreviated uh, description of interoception from Stephen Porges. And it relates to just what I was just talking about. Sensory receptors originating in the body cavity, in this case, the viscera, Monitoring internal body state. This is uh, internal body state relative. This is part of the description of interoception. Triggering motor pathways and releasing hormones that manipulate various organs, changes the organs based on the feedback loops that's happening. 
The vagus with its sensory and motor pathways is the primary component of the interoceptive system. So I'm going to show you now. This is the, the vagus nerve. And you see, first of all, its vertical orientation. And you see the connection with the organs and the cavities of the body. So all the while, when all this movement is happening at many levels, the vagus nerve is tuning into the, the organs and the cavities with that, uh, those feedback loops of sensory motor uh, activity. Now when the, 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 when these frozen states, these mobilized states and stress jacket states have many places they can hide in the cavities of the body. They can hide in anywhere in the body, the bones and nerves and fluids, uh, fascia, and they can find particular ways of fi finding, uh, look at all the places where they can go deep in the viscera and be kind of lost for a long time. But with this constant movement, as I was showing, that, that happens on the tuning board, that movement will find those places, even in the deep places of the viscera. Okay. All right, the tuning board is a somatic tool that addresses this problem of non-resilient ability to return to a fluid vertical nervous system. Again, another way of describing what the tuning board is and what it does. So there's resources that support vertical embodiment. The first four here, balance, grounding, orienting, and centering, are more or less, they're, al they're almost like a simultaneous um, negotiation we have to make when we get on the tuning board. First of all, is it's in a context of balance, so the first, uh, task we have is how are we relating to our verticality? How are our reflex systems, our postural, vestibular, et cetera, reflexes are relating to balance as we are vertical? And one of the resources that's primary in, in supporting that is first of all grounding. What are our feet doing? How does it feel? How do we orient the fact that our feet are in motion, they're stimulated, and um, can we really uh, allow ourselves to, to embody in that grounded area of our own bodies in motion as it's being stimulated. Orienting, okay, so there we are in uh, vertically oriented in space. What does that mean? What is that like? That's another um, immediate negotiation task. And then finally, because of the persistent motion of the tuning board, we come to consider what centering really feels like and how attuned we are to centering in any given moment. Again, the movement will not stop. It will not, it will not cease in having us uh, have to consider and negotiate our relationship to centering and all these initial four uh, qualities and resources of um, being in vertical embodiment and being on the tuning board. The last three, spaciousness, healthy tone, which is another way of saying resiliency and elasticity and connection, tend to be, um, they're equally important, but they tend to be what we have to negotiate as we work with this uh, relationship between the constant motion of the tune board relative to the immobilizations that we've lost track of or didn't even know existed. So these seven embodiment resources are primary. They are stimulated spontaneously and inherently by the tuning board and the movement on the tuning board. Okay, so that's essentially a description of um, what I was going to lay out. Defining somatic experiencing, defining trauma, what does the tuning board do? How does the tuning board relate to somatic experiencing and trauma? And um, what's the value and the, the, the meaning behind vertical integration and verticality? So what I'm gonna do now 
I think we're at the point where, is this right, Emily, where we're doing the demo? Yeah, that's right, Daryl. Okay, so we're going to do a demonstration now. Um, it's going to, you know, be enough to show you hopefully what this looks like, everything that I just described and talked about, what it looks like when we're actually on the tuning board. And uh, what's going to help me is Vivian. Um, I'm not sure how to get out of this here. Oh, there we go. Okay. This is Vivian, and she's going to be the model for today. And um, I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about how this tuning board works at a, at a very basic level. Okay. Okay, first we just orient to be behind the tuning board. Can you all, can you hear me okay, Emily? Uh, a little louder, Daryl, if you can. Okay, a little louder. All right, so first we're, we're just going to, um, Vivian knows the tuning board is going to move, so there's already some something going on in her, in her nervous system, knowing that this tuning board is going to present constant motion throughout her body. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to be present with her as she comes on because it's a change, it's a, it's a change of state. We're going from a more stable state to a state in motion, which is a, not really an ordinary, we call it a non-ordinary state or a non-ordinary reality because it's a slightly amplified and slightly accelerated natural motion. So we're going to move moving on. And I'm going to cue her to what I call a refined foot position. In this refined foot position, her feet are pointing straight ahead. If you ever see any um, uh, picture of what's called a quote ideal posture, you'll always see it aligned like, like this. The feet are pointing straight ahead and the legs are underneath the mass of the body that's coming down. It's not shoulder width apart as is typically described, but it's more like this. And what I found is that this provides the most availability to the deepest level of this refined movement to go through all areas of the body, especially those deep cavity areas in the viscera. So here's Vivian and she's already making some adjustment to the relationship on the tuning board. Can you say anything about that, Vivian? Well, I, um, I just, I haven't been moving a lot in the last several days. And so as I get on, I'm aware of, of that there isn't that great flow going through my body. It feels a little bit rigid. And I feel that when I get on it um, because it's moving and my whole body is kind of reacting with big reactions versus. Okay, that's a lot of information. But one thing I see right away is even though she feels the rigidity and the lack of movement, she's moving. And you can see she's in constant motion right now because the tuning board provides that. So her feet and ankles, as you saw in that diagram of the nervous system, they are working. The proprioception is being stimulated and sensory and motor loops, feedback loops are happening wherever they can, they're already starting. Daryl, we have a request. If, you if you're able to be even a little louder, that would be helpful. Yeah. I'll try. <laughs> okay. Okay. I feel, now I feel more awareness of my feet and legs, and I feel that my feet and legs are beginning to respond at a more subtle level. So I hope you heard that and, and can actually see that happening. Again, this persistent movement is, is still carrying on, even though there's areas where she doesn't feel the mobility, the movement is still continuing. Now, maybe you can say a little bit about the relationship of uh, well, and where you identify the where it's not moving? Well, when I, I mean, it's already changing a lot because when I first got on, I felt like there was some way my whole body was just kind of reacting like a single thing. And now I feel that, um, I feel that the movement is just much more, lots of very small, subtle movements that are connected with each 
each other all the way through the body, right? So I'm just starting to breathe a little differently in the way. Is there anywhere that it feels it's not moving right now? Yes. I feel like like at the top of my my below my neck and the top of my spine, my shoulders, I feel like I'm holding something. So I, I'm going to encourage uh, Vivian to feel this contrast of where it's not moving up in her, her neck and shoulders, and also feel at the same time how it is moving, holding both of those at the same time. Well, I, it's interesting because just that awareness of how it's starting to you know, move more on the way up and that there's more movement in my breath and just your kind of soothe. It's like, oh, well, I can, I can feel that those two things are meeting and I can feel that it, it feels like, yeah, there's something a little bit uncomfortably achy in my awareness of this part that's moving less, but then I also feel like it's starting to be connected. Okay, so I'm going to encourage Vivian now. Vivian, let see if you can be right where the movement and the not movement are in contact with each other. Now see if you can be very precise and in your body. I do feel where that is. Can you, can you tell us or point to where that is? I feel like. Um, I feel like, again, it's just around the top of the scapula and the clavicle and the top uh, vertebrae of the um, thoracic spine and the lower vertebrae of the cervical spine. Okay, so we're going to just allow the movement to keep playing into this area. And you would keep your hand where you're pointing, like mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. this hand, and keep this one. So we're going to go right to the area where these two are meeting. And just take your time. So a lot of what's happening is at, at a reflex level, but also, again, guiding the person's awareness to the sensations and the movement in the body, guiding that awareness to the proprioception, to the kinesthetics, to the interoception. And what you start to see now is Vivian is beginning to interact with that place where the two come together. It's on the bottom right. Yeah, that's what I feel like doing. So yeah. I'm going to have you slow down a little bit. So what she's doing is now she's adding some conscious play movement into this relationship between the, the holding pattern and the flow of motion, the, the priming of the pump and the priming of the process. That the tuning board is continuing gently to send through her body. So, the idea now I'm going to have Vivian just play slowly and, and gently with that relationship where those two come together. So, she's adding another component, guiding awareness, guiding awareness to the sensation, to what's happening in the body, to what's happening with this proprioception and my kinesthetic processes and what's going on? Well, I'm noticing a lot. <laughs> so I'm noticing, um, now I'm noticing, you know, where before I was describing the vertical aspects, now I'm noticing a real left right differences. And that whereas on the left side, everything feels more open, more visible, kind of more alive. On the right side, Everything is just a little bit, I feel there's some kind of almost hidden quality in my sensations on the right side. So I'm going to encourage her to stay with that again, allowing this presence, this awareness of the clients or the subjects, awareness of this, what's happening in her body as the movement continues to be gently flowing through. Yeah, I 
feel like I'm taking a bigger and better breath. And at the same time, there's a kind of a jittery quality in my awareness. Which I don't well, quite know how to describe. Well, one thing I noticed uh, from Vivian is when she, the difference now from when she first stood on the keyboard. And I can see a lot more uh, flow than movement. I was continues up past this area where it was being kind of um, not quite getting through as a flow of movement. And now it's happening a little bit more freely. There's still restriction, it's still not quite totally resolute, resolution of this. But we're just staying with it, allowing the process, allowing the movement, and supporting whatever emerges as a result. Yeah, I feel, I also feel what you're describing. I feel like the movement is going farther. And I also feel this kind of, I don't know how to say it, but it's kind of a jittery quality that's even, you know, happening around you know, my lower cranium and my jaw. And so we'll just stay with that. This is a release of energy, a release of information. And what's that like? Um, it, it actually feels um, potent. Yeah. 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 Every time Vivian takes one of these breaths, you can see. To me, that's a very integrative breath. Um, it's kind of a, a freeing of the diaphragm to, to allow it to drop and an inhale. Maybe a release of some tension around the ribs that would kind of constrict the, the lungs from really allowing it to fully expand. So that lets me know that at some stage there's been some resolution of this tension between movement and the, the holding pattern that's been going on. So we've already gone through several cycles of that. Just in my my awareness is that there was just way more tension than I was aware of in my upper body and going all the way into my head and that it's letting go and then it's there it feels almost be something really very strong and energetic and that letting go and it just feels like there's there could be some release <laughs> of something that I didn't really realize was there. You feel any release all the time. <clears throat> I do. I mean, there's something just in the movement and the jittery quality that feels like relief and that feels like I could just, it makes me feel like, well, when we're done, you know, maybe I need to go be by myself and have a little cry or. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like there, there is relief and there could be more. <clears throat> so, Vivian, just a reminder, if, you, if you're if you able to speak up, um, that's still helpful. Okay. So we're, I'm going to encourage for a moment, whatever relief is there, you're not going to push it. Just feel the, feel the relief that's there. <sighs> feels good. Just let that carry through with the motion of the tuning board into a new place. That's good? Yeah, that's good. And so we're going to slowly come off to a changing state <clears throat> from an accelerated motion under the feet to something that's more stable. So we're going to stand for a moment and we'll hopefully feel a continuation of the movement, even though the ground is still a little more stable and the motion going through the nervous system and the body is still present. That sound about right? That's, that's what I feel. And I feel, you know, again, an awareness of something that's kind of opened up, especially around my throat. So we're going to encourage that a little more. Go ahead and stay with that a moment now more. Just a 
allow that to embody, allow and embody this something changed to some degree or other, something is different than it was before we got on. And it has to do with relief and feeling better and feeling freer and feeling like you can breathe more easily. I also feel closer to the ground, more connected to the ground. Okay, so that's a, that's a quick demonstration. Well, quick in a relative sense, I'd say. Um, and just uh, showing what it looks like, uh, what everything that I described earlier about these definitions and concepts, what it actually looks like, and how we begin to engage and work with someone in that context. So I think we're, where are we, Emily? Great. So um, we, have, we have some great questions coming in, Daryl, in the chat that I've been noting down. Okay. So we'll move to questions, but I wonder if you have any closing that you, you, you'd like before moving into our, our Q&A. No, I think, I think that's it. I think maybe the, the questions might help round things out. Hopefully, um, there was enough clarity in what you heard and saw so that um, you might feel like there's, you understand possibilities and be inspired. And so go ahead, any, so go ahead with the questions. Great. Um, so we have, we have a couple questions about re recommendations for how long to stand on the tuning board. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we, we have Barbara who shared that she finds it takes an important amount of time for integration afterwards. Um, sometimes the client is on the tuning board for 10 minutes and then it takes 30 minutes of integration time. Um, and so, and this is a, yeah, this is, and, and in her mind it takes around the same amount of time. And this is a client who has complex PTSD and attachment rupture and neglect history. Um, so. So, so that was also echoed by another person saying this, this could be a lot of nervous system input. So what is the ideal length of session for using the tuning board? It sounds like both time on and then integration time off. You know, I have no set rule for that. I, uh, I tell people even five minutes has some value. Um, but it sounds like what's being described here, uh, 10 minutes on the tuning board is enough to really stimulate enough enough depth and enough um, uh, need for integration that 30 minutes of integration is not out of line, whatever that is required for that particular individual. You know, our, our, our trauma is never, um, the traumas and stress that we experience is never symmetrical and it's never, it's like two snowflakes, you know, there's, there's never two that are exactly alike. So part of our, um, our resiliency as practitioners is to uh, be exactly aware of what's being described. 10 minutes looks like, oh, that's plenty. And if we need 30 minutes for um, integration, that sounds perfect. Some other people, I've had people on for an hour or more and the integration is um, you know, much shorter, but the integration, because they're resourced and supported, they can do a lot of the integration. A lot of it happens on their own because that's what uh, healing is. You know, that's what, when our nervous system gets uh, functioning, it's self-regulating. And that's part of the qualities that we're trying to restore from these uh, traumatic experiences. Great, thanks, Daryl. Um, so we also have a question about what, uh, this was a, a two-part question. So first, um, logistics that you'd recommend for somebody um, who's had a stroke and left side uh, hemiparesis, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, um, and thoughts on EMDR as an adjunct to healing trauma related to uh, blocking stroke recovery. Well, <laughs> I mean, with stroke, I think a lot depends on which parts of the brain were affected. 
Uh, and I think EMDR is a, is, a, is a modality that has some value and use and um, could even be used uh, with someone on the tuning board. Maybe with a stroke person, we, we start with someone sitting on the tuning board and you can do that by putting it on a, a chair or a couch or something, put the tuning board on something sort of firm but it takes away the, uh, the extra task of trying to stand vertically, especially if, um, from a stroke, uh, that, that vertical ability has been compromised. So you could start someone with a stroke sitting, you could actually do EMDR at the same time and uh, track what kind of responses are happening I would find out which specific areas of the brain might have been affected. That, I think that would be very useful for a stroke person. Great, thanks, Daryl. Um, in in some something actually quite question related to what you just shared, um, we have a question about um, a, a version of the tuning board that that can work better for sitting. So this person felt that the the version for the feet. Uh, it doesn't seem to work as well for sitting unless there's a specialized kind of shorter chair so that the weight can be centered. So any other recommendations related to clients who, um, who are, where it might be better suited for them to sit on it? Uh, I haven't found anything. What I recommend for the, is put a, on the tuning board, put like a, maybe a yoga blanket or something. So you feel a little bit of a, you don't feel like you know, the, the board directly on the sit bones, you feel a little bit of cushioning, but you don't want to lose uh, a certain firm response again, just like when on the feet. We don't want to feel like the bottom's dropping out because that tends to be more like that um, parasympathetic collapse response, which, you know, it's not necessarily a balanced, uh, uh, doesn't encourage a balanced process at that point. So if you can find something that has some play and give, has uh, some firmness as well. Uh, like I said, I haven't found anything that's quite as good as a tuning board sitting with a yoga blanket or a, a kind of a cushion. Oops, okay, great. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions that have come in about um, the size of the tuning board and um, what, um, what, are, what are the recommendations for beginner users related to, I guess, size, it's more the, 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 um, the buoyancy, I don't know what we would call that, but so some people are kind of, we have a few questions about that. Yeah, weight distributions, thank you. Um, somebody sent in a note. So what, do you, what are your recommendations about that for related to beginners, related to, for example, somebody who's six foot four? Um, yeah, how would you describe that? Well, the stiffer the resistance, the less movement you get. And so that can have some value for someone who's very traumatized because it makes the movement a little smaller and maybe feel a little safer. If you have someone very heavy on a light tuning board, it, it'll bottom out and you won't get much movement. Um, the weights that are suggested tend to be, uh, offer a, more of an ideal uh, possibility for this. It's kind of a sweet zone, you know, the, of, of motion that uh, really enhances a deeper level of refinement. Um, and for me, that's what I'm always looking for, is how to refine this, this, uh, this sense of the motion at all these levels, the proprioceptive and the visceral level, uh, even in every system of the body. So it can be, um, like I said, the greater the resistance, the, the smaller the movement, and the safer the movement feeling in the person. But at eventually at some point you wanna get them to what might feel like more of an ideal flow of, of sensation and flow of kinesthetics and proprioception going through the body. 
Right. So, so for example, a lighter client might benefit from a, a um, the heavier weighted tuning board if their nervous system is in a state where they it, you really want it to be as gentle as possible. Right. As an example but of what you're saying. Contrast the heavy person on the light board. You know, they may not get much movement at all. Okay. Great. Um, so we also, we have a couple of questions about how the usage of the tuning board might compare with how Peter Levine uses a trampoline with clients and kind of interest oh, in that. Bellicon, you mean. You know, um, well, the tuning board is more refined. You know, I've been on both and I've seen him do work on both. And, uh, you know, they have their value. The Bellicon has, has a value. Uh, what I find is it tends to be more uh, mobilizing, stimulating, mobilizing. It tends to um, elicit more uh, the play and the active aspect, um, which has some value and it can be good. When you move from the, from the bellicon to the tuning board, it's amazing how you feel that, that instant kind of a very fine, change in how the, how the nervous system is moving. So the other thing about the Bellicon is, again, that feeling like it uh, has value for what it is, but I, I, don't have, I, don't have, I don't prefer when my feet feel like they're kind of, you know, just giving and, and collapsing under me. Um, I like to feel that nice combination of a a firm feedback with a soft feedback. And, uh, you know, you just use them for what they are. And what I've seen uh, uh, Peter do is use one and then the other. And I've seen him, uh, you know, end up with the tuning board, which to me has a much more deep, deeper refinement to it. But the Balcon has value as well. Great. Um... So we have a question about um, what uh, what would a full session with the or how how might a full session with the tuning board differ from this demonstration here? So so what else might happen as the session progressed? Well, I take her deeper into these areas that um, she describes as not moving or just uh, that are uncomfortable, and you saw so many uh, gestures that came up that were emerged from uh, uh, Vivian talking about them, you know, when she was moving to her neck and her back and everything. And all these are part of the information that gets freed up and released when we start to touch into this um, titration of movement against immobility. So a lot of it would be exploring those, uh, those gesture expressions and how they relate to uh, how she's feeling um, from a somatic, you know, in, from a somatic point of view, uh, what she she expressed uh, some affect. So we'd make associations with the gesture, the affect, and the, and what's happening from a sensation point of view, making these associations, and just slowing the process down so these associations are are free to connect and have the room they need, and. Of course, from an SE point of view, what I'm talking about are the Cyban elements. So she was demonstrating some of them. She was demonstrating some behavior and some affect and sensation. Um, we could track that for as uh, long as it felt appropriate. It could take an hour to do that. Maybe there was associations in just those three, but maybe they would go even to, to deeper into some uh, Maybe you go in, in, in memories and meaning and <clears throat> she would be filling in and, and interpreting what this all means to her. Great. Thank you, Daryl. So, so we there, have... There is um, one other element of this, which I think to me is extremely important and um, a valuable tool. Uh, you know, it's the it's the image part of things, but it's not just the image that might arise in the process. It's the use and activation of the, of the individual's imagination. So for me, the I part is not just an image, but it's also 
that the imagination, which is a, I find is a very powerful tool to incorporate. So we could even play with that for a longer session, um, for example. Great. So um, we we have just a few another couple minutes to to answer a few questions and there's some here. Um, there's one related to um, getting a, a feeling of numb sensations in the feet and toes, like a pinched nerve nerve mm -hmm. after spending a while on the board. Um, and and yeah, how how you might address that? Well, I'd play with it. You know, how much uh, is it getting worse? Do we need to take a break, step off? Do we need a massage? Is there some kind of um, really structural or neurological damage or issues going on? Uh, we certainly don't want to um, uh, overdo any uh, condition that, that would be uh, adversely affected by standing too long. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of open. It's, it's playing with it, it's trying to understand it, it's trying to bring relief. And sometimes that relief may be, okay, let's take, come off, let's sit, let's see what's happening with your feet now. And maybe we can explore uh, off the tuning board what happened from the awareness of what's happening in the feet. And maybe that can take us more into a somatic experiencing process off the tuning board. Right. Um, so I have, um, we, we have a, some more questions coming in that I'm afraid we probably won't get to all of them today, but so good to see the interest. Um, and I may just ask one um, final question around, um, uh, this is kind of an open-ended one, but how, how big is the impact on the system? Does the tuning board make things go deeper? Um, and, and maybe we'll, these other ones, if you want to add them in the chat, it's good to know. And we can actually use these in the next session that we do. We can uh, see how we might be able to address the remaining questions that we're not able to cover today. So I'll, I'll just- make things go way. deeper? Yeah. Well, if, you, if you're working a good uh, process, you're transforming, you're not driving, you're not driving the immobilities deeper, you're transforming them. Like again, it's that process of the, the uh, pendulation where you're, where you're using expansion and back and forth, titrating back and forth between expansion and contraction while you're moving the whole system into a more open and fluid balanced place, N never to drive it deeper, no. But that's part of the, the art and skill of, of, of the practice. Great, thank you, Daryl. Um, and I just, I, one note in the, in the chat, we did have a question about for, for a practitioner who's looking to buy a tuning board, which, um, which weight to get. And um, we had a recommendation that typically a medium would be the best place to start for most clients. For most um, average weight clients, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that would be the. You're gonna use it for yourself. Primarily you wanna get something that works well for yourself. And that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the most beautiful things about the tuning board is even if you don't, um, if you don't have a client on it, it's still the value that it has for our own nervous system. Everything I described, allowing that to have a, a, a deeper experience and a more full experience of that kind of self-regulating balance and flow as a practitioner is only gonna help your sense of however you work on anyone. And it doesn't take much, you know, like I said, you can start with just a few minutes a day. It's amazing uh, how you, you're gonna start out being on a tuning board for a few minutes and then you look and you want to, oh my gosh, that was 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I didn't even realize it because this movement is, is so wonderfully compatible with uh, a natural flow and a, a natural healthy um, healing flow of, of movement through the body. Great. 
And we, and we have, I just, there's a comment I'd like to read um, from Barbara, who to, to your point, Daryl is saying that the tuning board has changed the SE work in her office profoundly. It's playful and at the same time effective. So. Yeah, you know, I've, I've gotten feedback from um, people that just use the tuning board to stand on. And, and this one woman uh, was telling me how her husband he stood on it every day, you know, for a year or more, and he still does, like, apparently, but he stopped having epileptic fits, and he attributes it to being on this, this tuning board. So there's not uh, scientific research around that, but there is experiential feedback that I've gotten along those lines from, from various people over time. Right. So, um, so we have a number of additional questions that have come in. And so thank you for your grace. And we, we want to respect everybody's time, seeing that we're at the at time now. Um, but we would like to encourage you to stay tuned uh, for future online or in-person trainings. Um, we don't have schedules to share with you yet, but um, you should be receiving information about those. I'm also um, posting on the chat, uh, the website, where we'll have information about upcoming online trainings and hopefully in the not so distant future, um, in-person trainings. Um, and we'd also like to offer a discount code uh, for 10% off um, on, on the tuning board. So that's uh, Gravity Dance, which I've just added into the chat. So I think that's all for my end. Daryl, anything, any last thoughts to share? Uh, yes, let's see. Um, I'm so grateful that you all came to this. It's, it's really, uh, it's really feels wonderful to me to, even though I can't see you all and it's all virtual, it's, it's nice. I feel the connection and I hope to see you in, um, uh, I have many trainings listed on the website and maybe Vivian can mention a little bit about a recent article relative to tuning board and, and somatic experiencing uh, and any any other ways to stay connected. I am interested in your questions so if you want to um, if you want to put your questions I'll see if I can answer them in some form and um, get back to you about them but Again, just thank you all very much.